We've been on this for some weeks now. The series we're calling Abounding Ability. Abounding Ability. I do believe the Lord's in it. I believe it's a part of his plan for us. You know, he, he adds to you piece by piece and part by part. And everything he's given us is preparing us for the next part. It all works together. And uh, it excites me because why would he be talking to us about abounding ability? Why? <laughs> if not that it's, he's about to add to us. Right? And, in, and, and we need to remove everything that would hinder him from adding to us and put us on a whole nother level. Right? Don't you like that? Yeah. On a whole nother level. I mean, that's what's happening with the word supply. That's right. Isn't it? We've been sowing, giving our materials for years, but man, we're, we're getting ready to sow and give on a, a whole nother level. And I believe that's not just limited to that part of the ministry, but it's for every individual, every family, hmm? every Every, you know, business and, and ministry that's, we're all connected together on this. And so our texts have been in 2 Corinthians 9, where he talks about, in verse uh, 5, I'm reading the NIV. He said, I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to visit you in advance and finish the arrangements for the generous gift you had promised. Then it will be ready as a generous gift, not as one given grudgingly. Now that's what we were just reading about when he said, set, uh, set by you uh, the first of every week. And then he, he if you've gone on to read in that, that passage in 1 Corinthians 16, he said uh, that there be no gatherings when I come. That you don't have to try to get it together when I get there, but that if you'll set something aside on a regular basis every week, You'll have it. Is that a scriptural principle? Yes. We're seeing two chapters in the New Testament that deal with this. And so that's what he's telling them. In fact, um, let me read this from another translation. You believing with me this evening? Yes. Please do. You know I can't do a thing except what he would help me to do what he would enable us to do. In, uh, let's see. Let's read in the New Living Translation. New Living Translation. And Let's just start at verse 1. You're not in a big rush, are you? He said, I really don't need to write to you about this ministry of giving for the believers of Jerusalem. Now, why would he not need to write to them? They've already heard about it. He knows what he's already taught them about it, right? They already know about giving and receiving. He said, I know how eager you are to help. And uh, I've been boasting to the churches in Macedonia that you in Greece were ready to send an offering a year ago. So I guess it'd be all right for me to brag on you a little bit, uh, other folks, if you were ready to give, huh? I said, man, I pastor the givingest churches you ever saw. Hallelujah. Glory. Huh? Amen. That'd be sounding like Paul, wouldn't it? I said, oh, my bunch. Ready to give? Are you kidding? They're ready right now. Amen. They're ready. And he had been obviously been telling other folks about his churches there in uh, Macedonia. No, he was telling the churches in Macedonia about these churches in Corinth. He said that you were ready a year ago. He said, my guys in Corinth, uh, y'all talking about now, they were ready uh, a year ago. He said, I was bragging some. In fact, it was your enthusiasm that stirred up many of the Macedonian believers to begin giving. Did you know you being a giver can inspire other people to be givers instead of being selfish? Whether it's a church or a family or an individual, it's inspirational when you see other people doing good and strong things. 
makes you want to do good things. Keep reading. He said, but I'm sending these brothers to be sure you really are ready. (laughs) Ready for what? Ready to give this big offering. As I have been telling them and that your money is all collected. I don't want to be wrong in my boasting about you. (laughs) Isn't this interesting? Keep reading. We would be embarrassed, not to mention your own embarrassment, if some Macedonian believers came with me and found that you weren't ready after all I told them. (laughs) Why? If they got there and they had not been laying aside on a weekly basis and they didn't have it and it wasn't ready, he said it'd be embarrassing to you and to me. (laughs) keep reading so I thought I should send these brothers ahead of me to make sure the gift you promised is ready but I want it to be a what? willing Willing gift not one given grudgingly And, and can you see this that so many times when there come kingdom projects or there come needs Uh, in churches and groups that the reason there is such a pull and such a push and so much begging and pleading and pressure is because nobody's ready. Nobody was ready. The church wasn't ready. The pastor wasn't ready. The people wasn't ready. So everybody's scrambling. And how many understand you can't make up? For the past 10 years of doing nothing. By putting a lot of pressure on each other. For a few days. It's just not there. And you can't change the past. You know what you can do? I said you know what you can do? You can make a change. And quit fussing. And quit arguing. And quit being stingy and selfish. And forget about preachers and churches. We're talking about between you and the Lord. Between you and the Lord, make up your mind. As for me and mine, we're going to serve the Lord. And I'm I'm going to set aside tithes and offerings. Every time I make money, every time I get paid. And what if you did that? And the people that sat in front of you did that? And the people that sat behind you did that? And everybody that sat on each side of you did that. And the pastors did that. Come on in. There's a lot of preachers don't tithe. I know it. And the church is doing it. And everybody's doing it. Then when things come up. We wouldn't be scrambling. Pressuring each other. Begging each other. Come on are you listening. Can you see what a different operation this would be. When it come, came time to do something. I'd be checking my heart just like I did this week. Just like I've done in times past. Lord, should we be involved in this? To what degree should we be involved in this? If you got nothing, you don't, what are you asking about? (laughs) And you, in a short amount of time, when some kingdom project comes up or some uh, need comes up, you can be back in the crowd before, during offering time bowing your head going, okay, Lord, you want me to do half of this? You want me to do all of this? What you want us to do? Because week after week and month after month, it's been accruing. And now there's resources there. Come on, can you see this, saints? It's not just some big something you push for on a Sunday or a special meeting, this is a way of life. It's a lifestyle, a way of living. And it's not, forget about preachers and churches. This is about you believing the Word, you putting the Lord first in your life and in your family. We see this so clear and believe it so strong. A lot of our marriage ceremonies that occur in the church now, it's their choice but they have included tithing in their wedding vows. Well, are you going to want God to rebuke the devourer off of your family 
and your chi- your kids' resources, huh? And and and, and abund- you you gonna look to him to be your provider the rest of your married life, and your kids and your grandkids. Well, well, why not make that commitment to him, and include him in that part of your life? I know a lot of people don't do it. I know a lot of people fuss about it and they argue. And I know there's a lot of preachers that have misused scriptures and, and bent things and twisted things. But, but get your mind off of that. Like I said, forget about preachers. Forget about churches. How about you and him? What, what do you believe he told you? Are you doing what you believe he told you in these regards? And can you see what he's talking about? I, I, I don't want you to not be ready. Well, how are they going to be ready? Well, you don't have to wonder about it. Just, uh, what, 10 chapters previous <laughs> in 1 Corinthians 16 is the first letter to the same church. It's when he told them what to do. The first of every week. Lay it aside. Right? Lay it aside. And then they're going to be ready. Now keep reading. He said, uh, I thought I'd send these brothers ahead of me to make sure the gift you promised is ready. I want it to be a willing gift, not one given grudgingly. Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. I'm excited because, you know, Phyllis and I first started off uh, in this sowing and reaping by faith. We sowed five, we had, we had ten dollars in a meeting. We sowed five in the offering, and with the remaining five, we bought some ministry materials. <laughs> One tape. <laughs> and uh, so we sowed five dollars, but that was big for us. That's where we were. Don't despise where you are. Right? That was 50% of our resources. <laughs> right? But in more recent times, we see the churches are, and, and us, we're so in, in bigger increments. That's exciting, right? Because according to this principle, if you sow generously, you're going to get what? Well, we all know that. If you plant a six by eight foot plot, what are you going to reap a harvest off of? Six by, what, what if you plant a thousand acres? <laughs> well, you're going to have much bigger harvest, right? And you and I, and the partners in More Life Ministry, the uh, church in Branson, we sowed a million dollar yeah. surplus seed a few weeks ago. Yeah. Didn't we? Yeah. And we've sowed, you know, hundreds of thousands and scores of thousands into feeding folks here and helping folks there. Do you believe that these seeds sown in good ground will produce a good harvest? Yeah. Well, it's not a harvest multiplied by three or four dollars. It's a harvest multiplied by scores of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and millions. Well, what's, where's that going to put us in the process of time? Where are we going to wind up at? With abounding. Somebody help me out. Abounding ability. <laughs> abounding ability. Abounding ability. Let, let's keep reading. He said, you, much, uh, you must each decide in your heart how much to give. Don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. Now notice the results of doing this. And God will generously provide all you need. Amen. Then you will always have everything you need. And plenty left over. To share with others. Hmm? This goes contrary to a lot of stuff that's taught in churches. People say, well, it might not be God's will for you to always have plenty. It might not be God's will for you to have plenty to give to others. It has to be. This is his book. Right? Has to be. Say it out loud. It is always the will of God. For us to always have have everything we need. need. And to have plenty left over. over. Beyond that. that. To share with others. others. That's always the will of God. For all of his people. people. All the time. time. You believe it? 
That's the first step in this, is getting your mind made up about that. He goes on to say, God will generously provide all you need, then you'll always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others, as the scriptures say. They share freely, they give generously to the poor, their good deeds will be remembered forever. Amen. Hallelujah. Somebody say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Goes on to say, for God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he'll provide and increase your resources. Amen. Increase your resources. Hallelujah. Somebody say, he's increasing my resources. And then he'll produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Amen. The liberal soul will be made fat. Generous soul. That's fat with resources. Yes, you'll be enriched in every way. So that you can always be generous. Hallelujah. And when we take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. So two good things will result from this ministry of giving. The needs of the believers in Jerusalem will be met. And they will joyfully express their thanks to God. As a result of your ministry, they'll give glory to God. For your generosity to them and to all believers will prove that you're obedient to the gospel, the good news of Christ. And they'll pray for you. How many like other people praying for you? Thank you, Lord. They'll pray for you with deep affection because of the overflowing grace God has given to you. Thank God for this gift, his gift, too wonderful for words. Amen. God so loved the world that he what? Yeah. He gave. And he gave us the greatest thing that's ever been given to anybody. Hallelujah. His son, eternal life, redemption. Can you say Amen. And I've been born of him, which makes me a giver child of a giver God. I take after my father. Say it out loud. I take after my father. Isn't he the greatest giver of all time? Isn't he? Well, that makes you a giver too. That makes you a giver too. Hallelujah. Look with me in, in uh, or they'll just put it up on the screen for us. John 10, 10 talks about this. We quoted it earlier. But he says the thief do, uh, doesn't come except for to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus said, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. The Amplified says that they might have and enjoy life, having an abundance to the full till it overflows. Now this word translated abundance is the same word that's translated there in 2 Corinthians 9. We were just reading that God uh, makes all grace come to you, that you can abound to every good work. This word abundance, uh, abounding, abundant, there's about, I don't know, seven plus different words in the New Testament that have the same root word. And what that, what that word means, we've told you before, but look it up for yourself. And make sure, you know, check up on me all the time. Make sure I'm reading it right. <laughs> Make sure I'm quoting it right. I'm serious. Check up on me. In fact, check up on everybody that you listen to. Right? Closely. Closely. Um, these words translated abundance or abounding, they mean to superabound, to be in excess, in the sense of beyond. One says excessive. Another one says enough and more. What does this word abundant, why did the Amplified translate it? Uh, to, to the full and till it overflows. Because the word means more than plenty, enough. It's enough plus. Which is why one author says superabundance or surplusage. If it's not surplus what you needed, then it's not what he's talking about. We don't serve a God who just fills the cup. Huh? What does he do? <laughs> he runs it over. When you give to him, how does it come back? 
good measure, pressed down, shaken together. Why? So you can get some more in. And what? Why running over? Why, why would God run the cup over? Why would he run the basket over? I mean, wouldn't he know how much to put in it to the last molecule so that it was as full as it could be without putting any over the side? Certainly he would know it, but why didn't he stop there? He's the God who gave Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob too many cows, too many goats, too many sheep. Didn't he? <laughs> He's the God who's created this vast planet. And this earth is in a fallen state because of sin and the curse. It's really different than the way it was originally created, which is why we have, have had tornadoes and earthquakes and uh, uh, hurricanes or, uh, you know, all this kind of, that's why it gets too hot or too cold. This is not how God made it. When God made it, it was perfect. But because of sin and the curse, things have been altered and they've been distorted. And eventually, uh, the Bible said the earth is groaning and travailing and that it's dying just like your body is. Well, see, our body's made out of the same stuff, right? It came from there. And people talk about saving the planet. We're not going to be able to. Now, there's no need to pollute it any, any faster than, than necessary. But at the same time, this planet is not our mother. No such thing as Mother Nature or Mother Earth. These terms are not in the Bible. They're not right. Actually, they, they refer to groups that centuries ago and thousands of years ago worshipped nature. And there's a recurrence of this in modern times and generations. We don't worship nature. We worship the God who created all of this. Right? And uh, anyhow, thank God, if you read the back of the book, you see there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth wherein there's no curse. And there dwells righteousness. And friends, when that happens, we're going to have the best weather you have ever experienced. The most perfect circumstances. Uh, you can run through the, the jungle as fast as you like and never step on a thorn. Come on, are y'all listening to me? And not have to be worried about being attacked by a lion because the lion's going to lay down with the lamb and become a vegetarian. Do you know that? The Bible said he's going to eat a straw like an ox. <laughs> it's, it, it, these things sound strange to us, but see, that's how it was supposed to be originally, and God's going to fix everything for us. Somebody say hallelujah, and you and I are going to be a part of it forever and ever. It's not a fairy tale. It's the Bible. Well, He's an abundant God, overflowing God, whose will is surplus or extra, excess. And if it is his will and call for you and I to help others, to be his vehicle to help others, if it's not enough, if what I have is not enough for me, it's certainly not enough for anyone else. Hmm? If what I have is only enough for me, it's still not enough for others. Right? What do I need? What do I need? I need surplusage. Right? It's got to be more than enough for me to be enough for others. Me and others. And that's the will of God. So when people say, oh, I don't, I don't believe in all that prosperity stuff. I just, if I just have enough just for me and for mine, that's all I need. That's all I care. Just, you know, just, just my basic necessities. And people think they're being humble. Uh, they've heard some of this stuff from the pulpit. But it never was the Bible. I said it never was the Bible. Never was Jesus. 
Jesus had surplus in his ministry. Yes. Hmm? He had enough that they helped people. They helped the poor on a regular basis. He had enough that they needed a treasurer. That's right. He had enough that the treasure embezzled. And they still functioned okay. How many understand if you only got three dollars and somebody takes one, you're going to know it. Right? <laughs> Go with me please to the book of Proverbs. The 28th chapter. Proverbs 28:20 20 says, A faithful man Shall what? Abound. abound. Now what does this word mean? Help me out. You've been hearing this for weeks. What does this word abound mean? It doesn't just mean having enough. It means excess. Over and above. Right? Surplus. A faithful man. Of course there are male men and female men. A faithful man shall abound with blessings, but he that makes haste is in a hurry to be rich shall not be innocent. Now this, we've already touched on this. Our main goal is not to be rich. Our main objective is not to, to get a lot of money and have a lot of stuff. Our main objective is not houses and cars and, and lands. Our main objective is pleasing God. Right? And a big part of what pleases Him is helping others. And it takes resources to do that. Doesn't it? And so yes, we believe in prosperity. And yes, we believe that God's a good God and will bless you in the material realm. But it's not just so we can stockpile stuff. We're believing for abounding ability to have all we need plus. Right? Now we've talked about this before. Uh, just because you have more come in, that does not automatically mean you'll have surplus. Does it? Your income could increase this year. It could double or triple. And it's still possible that by the end of the year, you'd be in worse shape financially than you are right now. <laughs> Is that right? Why? Because you can increase your spending. Right? You can increase your debt. You can, you can have more coming in but you can have even more going out. And it doesn't mean you have surplus or you're in better shape just because you have more coming in. So if you don't have surplus now, why would you have surplus with twice the income? If you did exactly the same thing you're doing with what you have right now, with twice the income. Why would you be in any better shape. Financially than you are now. You wouldn't be. <laughs> if, you're, if your spending was the same. Your spending to income ratio was the same. Your asset to debt ratio was the same. The numbers would be bigger. But you wouldn't be in any better shape. I'm pausing for effect. <laughs> I'm talking about me. I'm talking about you. I'm talking about all of us. We, do we believe God is a God of surplus? Yes. Abundance. Okay. It's the word. But obviously a whole lot of believers are not operating in much surplus. And a lot of them not operating in any surplus. Now we've already talked about the type of God's first covenant people that he delivered out of Egyptian bondage and how they, they were in Egypt living, which was not enough, total lack. And then he brought them in to wilderness living, which was just enough, but only enough. But then there was another level. 
Canaan living. Hallelujah. Where you would not want and lack for any good thing and you had surplus of every good thing. And 1 Corinthians tells us, the 10th chapter, that that's typical for us. That's a type of, of truth for us. So what kind of man or woman is going to abound with blessings? Anybody reading the scripture with me? Hmm? A faithful man. A faithful man. Put up on the screen 1 Corinthians 4.2. 1 Corinthians 4.2. It says, moreover, it's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. The NIV says, it's required that those who've been given a trust must prove faithful. The scripture says, what do you have that you didn't receive? And that a man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Now we know that in the world, you can lie, you can steal, you can get stuff apart from God. We're not talking about that. We're talking about believers. We're talking about you and I living by faith, getting things from him. When it comes to getting things from him, what God goes by in determining whether you, when and how and how much you and I receive more, it's based to in a large measure on our faithfulness. Our faithfulness with what he's already given us. If somebody is doing a bad job with what you've given them, are you smart to give them more? Is God smart or not so smart? <laughs> Does God know a good investment from a bad investment? <laughs> Is God so foolish and don't know that he would throw, as we say, good money after bad? If it's already going down, he's just going to keep pouring more and more resources? No. You'd be foolish, wouldn't you? Well, God's not foolish. So who's he going to give more resources to? I mean, you and I have this much smart. Right? Surely, he, you know he does. Hmm? Who's he going to give more resources to? People who are faithful to do what he wants done with it and do it his way. He's looking for people after his own heart that'll do it his way. Hmm? Can you say amen? amen. Say it out loud. A faithful, man a faithful man shall abound with blessings. What if the person's not abounding with blessings? You wouldn't want to just assume <laughs> that faithfulness was there. Go to Luke 16, please. I'm not preaching at anybody. I'm reading scriptures. I'm talking to me, just like I'm talking. How many believe these scriptures apply to all of us, right? All of us. I'm actually excited about this because I believe this principle that if Phyllis and I and the staff of the churches and you, if we will prove faithful where we are right now with what's in our hand right now, that God will increase us. You believe that? He'll increase us. And we might be handling smaller amounts right now, but within not too much time, we could be handling much more. Do you believe it? But instead of pulling and begging God for more, what should we be focusing on? We should get a revelation that the source is not the problem. Hasn't been the problem. Not going to be the problem. He's not the hold up. If something seems like it's just taking so long, God, what are you waiting on? <laughs> First thing to do is to go and look in the mirror. I'm telling you, in my own life experience, I've seen this over and over again where I'm beginning to get frustrated and I'm thinking, okay, God, okay, what's the hold up? When I hear that word, I've learned enough now to go, oh, okay. Okay. God doesn't fail. He doesn't miss it. He's not slow. 
He's not late. Do you believe God is not? He's none of these things. But people are. You know who people are, don't you? <laughs> Luke 16. This whole chapter, Luke 16, is rich in this subject. The whole chapter is about stewardship and faithfulness. Now the word steward and stewardship is just uh, you are trusted to handle something that's not yours. You're a, you, could, you could call it a trustee, a, a trusted one, but what you're handling is not yours. And so he tells the, gives the account of somebody who was an unfaithful, untrustworthy uh, steward who had mishandled his boss's resources. And so the boss found out about it and fired him, basically, because he was untrustworthy. We just got through reading in 1 Corinthians 4, what is the principal thing required in a steward? That a man be found faithful, or other translation said trustworthy. One translation says that he does exactly what his master tells him to. Now, and we're talking about with the Lord, when it comes to money, when it comes to material things, when it comes to resources, what would it mean to be faithful to God? That we do exactly what he tells us to do with it. Right? right? And if you don't, do you qualify for more? No, you don't. And if you don't qualify, you don't qualify, you keep messing up with it, you keep mishandling it, you keep not doing what he told you to do with it, well, that's going to delay things, isn't it? And even year after year can pass, and you're not experiencing the surplus or abundance. But is that God's fault? That's not his fault. That is not his fault. What kind of man or woman is going to abound with blessings? A faithful man. Luke 16 and 10. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. Who said this? Jesus. Red letters. Jesus. Head of the church. You believe, he, you believe he's speaking? You know what he said? He said, I don't speak of myself. What I hear the Father say, that's what I say. Yeah. Are we hearing God right here? Yeah. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful in much. He that is unjust, also you could say un unfaithful, untrustworthy, in the least is unjust, unfaithful, untrustworthy in much. Yeah. Is that true? Yeah. Well, that's what we were just talking about earlier. There's so many people that think, man, when my ship comes in, <laughs> I'm going to do something. Man, you know, if, if God would give me an extra million dollars, I'd do something. I'd help people. I'd help the poor. I'd help the church. I'd, I'd help preachers. You know what you'd do with it? You'd do exactly what you're doing with your extra hundred dollars. I didn't say it. The head of the church said it. Now, I know many, many people don't believe that. They go, oh, no, 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 no. I, you know, things have just been so tight. And, 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 but if I had 100,000, if I had a half a million, if I had, no, no, no. According to the head of the church, red letters, Jesus. You know what you'd do with an extra $10 million? Exactly what you're doing with an extra 100 or 1,000 right now. That's what you do with it. Me, you, every one of us. So, who should you give more to? Only those that are faithful in the $2 and the $5. Right? If a hundred times out of a hundred, you do what I ask you to do with a $10 bill, what do I know? In all likelihood, you're going to do the same thing with a $100 bill. Right? And if you do what you're told to do, 100 out of 100, with that $100 bill, what can we figure? You'd do the same thing with $1,000. Right? 
Now, if you've never been proven with ten or hundred dollars, I'm a fool to start you off with a million. I am. You're unproven. Have you seen in the scriptures, there's a principle, let them first be proved. I'm quoting a scripture. God is big on faithfulness. This applies to every area. When I was in the ministry for, I guess I was in like my third year or so, I had the privilege of working in the healing school, Brother Kenneth Hagin's ministry, and he was teaching there in the afternoon. I was just helping, cleaning up, setting up, tearing down, count, talking to people after the service if they wanted to talk about being saved or other, other type things. And uh, then I found myself, he was doing other things, and he allowed me and some others to speak in the healing school. And so I find myself, we had a, we'd have a laying on our hands time once a week. And there are people there in desperate situations. Some of, them, some of them had been told uh, you're incurable. Some were told that they probably should have been dead a week ago. And so if, if they don't get help from God, they, they you know, they're, some of them, as, as they say, living on borrowed time, they, they, they feel like. And so I'm the one who's going to minister to them. And I'm green as can be. <laughs> and there were times I'd go in before the, the, the service and I'd, I'd miss a meal, I'd miss lunch, and I'd pray and pray and, and, and I'd ask in the Lord, Lord, I know it's the anointing that destroys uh, yokes and removes burdens. I know it's the anointing. It was the anointing that came out of Jesus and healed that woman with the issue of blood, right? It's the anointing. That heals and delivers. It's not me. It's the anointing. But you use men and women. And so Lord I'm asking you for more anointing. These people need help. I can't heal them. Lord let the, let the anointing be strong on me. And for I don't know months. And longer. I begged for more anointing. <laughs> that's the way I prayed. I figured well, that's what I need. Right? I'm in a situation. These people you know. And Brother Hagin. He'd been in the ministry at that time for 40-something years. And, and uh, he had a special experience where the Lord ministered an anointing to him. Outstanding. Many miracles, many healings. But now these folks are going to get Keith. <laughs> Keith who? From where? Totally unknown. And I'm thinking, God, I, I need some more anointing. Because I, I don't feel a bunch of anointing like I hear him talking about and I'm not going to make up something I'm not going to pretend I do but I'm going to minister by faith but I know the stronger the anointing the better the results the stronger the anointing the easier it is for the people to believe so I'm pleading for more anointing more anointing more anointing and uh, I remember one, one day laying in the floor there at the uh, in the little speaker's room before the service, I'm going to lay hands on people. And the Lord spoke to my heart. I don't mean to heard a voice, but very distinctly. He said, faithful. Faithfulness. I sat up. I knew it was him. I thought, faithfulness? Faithfulness. Okay. God, I'll, I'll do a study on that. And I'll learn. But what I need right now... <laughs> Yeah, you're laughing. What I can you what, what am I about to say? I, what I need right now is more anointing. More anointing. <laughs> These people are in serious condition, Lord. They don't need a novice practicing on them. They need help and they need it right now. What we need is more anointing. And he said to my heart real strong, faithfulness. Faithfulness. I thought I'm not getting this. So I, I just stopped and I set up. I said, help me, Lord. Faithfulness. And I, I won't try to go into all the details. You know the Lord can reveal something to you so fast. Uh, you know it in a moment's time. It'd take you half a day to try to explain it. But just like that, I realized Brother Hagin and all those like him, they didn't start out with the anointing they're walking in after 40 and 50 years. 
He, he said it himself. He started out just by laying hands on people by faith and anointing people with oil. Sense no anointing as far as what you would sense. And that's what he kept me to see. He didn't start off in the anointing he's operating in now. He said, son, be faithful with what you have right now and I'll increase it. Glory to God. When you want more from God, this is always the way it works. I don't care if it's revelation. I don't care if it's anointing. I don't care if it's opportunity. I don't care if it's money and ability. It's always the same. Be faithful with what you have right now. And as I, as I lay there, I sat there, I began to realize I hadn't been doing that. I've been comparing the little bit I thought I had to the great amount that somebody else had and, and not appreciating what I had. Treating it like it was nothing. I got to quit that. I got to quit. He had told me on another occasion, he said, you remember the little boy's lunch? The five loaves and two fishes? He said, I can take a little and do a lot with it. That greatly encouraged me. This is not just an answer to one area. This is answer to area after area after area after area. Who is going to abound in blessings, have overflow? The faithful man or woman. I begin to see it. I went to Matthew and I went to Mark and instead of laying in the floor begging and, and crying, asking for more, I quit doing that. And I begin to confess, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He's anointed me. Anybody listening? I, I got to quit thinking about Brother Hagen or anybody else or what they've got. That's not what God gave me. And they themselves didn't start off there. They had to be faithful with what they had for him to add to them and get to the place where they are after 50 years. I got to forget about that. I got to be faithful. What does that mean? I got to do everything I know how to do and can do with what I've got right now, right here, today. Come on, is anybody listening? Right now. And he told me if I would, he would increase it. I did that. Sometimes, sometimes 30 minutes at a time. I'd sit there and get quiet by myself and say, the spirit of the Lord is on me. Because he's anointed me. The anointing is on me. The anointing is on me. <laughs> Hallelujah. The anointing is on me. The anointing that destroys yokes and removes burdens. Kills cancers. Dries up tumors. Yeah. I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about the anointing. Yeah. The anointing. Yeah. But he puts anointing on men and women. Mm -hmm. Did you know you, are you a born again child of God? Yes. Is the Holy Spirit living inside of you? Yes. Anointing's in you then. Yes. Anointing is in you. Yes. First John 2 says it. First John 2.20, 1 John 2.27 20, says you have an anointing. Uh -huh. Hallelujah. You, you so, somebody said out loud, I have an anointing. I I have an anointing. And you remember what the book of Acts said? You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you'll be witnesses unto me. That's anointing. That's power. In fact, uh, thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I had forgotten that and you told me that right now. He said, I also told you this. <laughs> he did. <laughs> At that same time, he told me this. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. That did not come out of my head. That wasn't in my head anywhere. It came right out, of my, right out of my spirit. I'm about to talk in tongues. He said, Keith, son, all of my people receive an anointing when they're filled with the Holy Spirit. He said, many of them have done nothing with that anointing. Why would they need more? Hallelujah. Is it true? Do you think it's true? Yes. He said many of them have done nothing with that anointing. Why would they need more? What's he telling me? Faithful. Be, use what you got. Be faithful with what you got. And if you will, I'll increase it. I'll add to it. So I begin to do that. 
And you know, days pass by, weeks pass by, months pass by. I begin to sense the anointing a little stronger from time to time. And I just stayed after it. And I won't go into all the detail, but there were a couple of significant things happened over the course of the next 10 years. Until it got to, there, there were some times when the anointing was so strong, I could hardly stand up. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yes. Glory to God. Yes. I know some folks don't believe in that, but don't knock what you don't know. And we're going to have some glorious healing meetings right here in this church. Hallelujah. Some miraculous and glorious healing meetings. You believe it? Hallelujah. Over the course of the next years. Everybody say years. See, folks are looking for a quick fix. They're looking for instant everything. That's not how God works. And when it comes to material things, who's going to get greater resources? People who will obey him in the $5, the $10, the $20. And what has happened with so many people, they, they wouldn't obey him in the 20 And then again, they didn't obey him six months later with the 50 And then in five years later, they didn't, they didn't obey him with the 20 or the 50 again. And so they're wondering, well, God, what's the problem? You're not waiting on him. Again and again, we're not waiting on him. Go with me to another place here. See the scriptures, how plain they are on this. Uh, Matthew 13. I think we ought to say it out loud. I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. Hallelujah. Now what did he tell us? He told us in the word. He told me that same thing by his spirit in that situation. He said, if you'll be faithful in what you have right now, what did he say? I'll increase it. I'll add to it. Do you believe that? Yes. You believe that? Yes. In Matthew 13 and 12, Matthew 13 and 12 says, whosoever has, what's going to happen? To him shall be given, and, and he will wind up how? He will have what? Well, see, that, that's the same words we've been talking about, looking at. He's going to have surplus. He's going to have abundance. But d- does it happen for everybody? No. To him, whoever has not, from him shall be taken away. Even that he has. What does that mean? Is it talking about what we're talking about right now? It is. In fact, in some of the same, if you keep reading in that that 16th chapter and you keep reading here in Matthew, you'll see these thoughts run together about faithfulness and to him that has shall more be given. You'll find it in Matthew, you'll find it in Mark, you'll find it in Luke, you'll find it in John. It's repeated over and over again. Now go with me. Uh, to Mark. Let's just look at a couple of them. You said you had time. Mark 4 24. Mark 4 24 Jesus said to them take heed what you hear. Why? You're hearing something right now. Is it a big deal or not? It's a bigger deal than most people have any idea about. Why? Because how much you get Tomorrow and next week and next month is going to be based on what you do with this. Take heed what you hear with what measure you meet. It shall be measured to you and unto you that hear. And you got to put that with the first part of the, those that hear with a big measure. What's going to happen? What's going to happen? You want to get more? Who wants to get more? What's the key to getting more? Being faithful with what you got right now. With what's happening right here and right now. It's so easy to just get goofy, romantic notions 
about one of these days. Hmm? I'm going to go and do this and I'm going to go and do that. And Whether you ever do anything substantial tomorrow is tied directly to what you're doing right now. Whether you get from here to there, how long it takes, or even if you ever get there, depends on what you're doing right now with what you got right now. Because according to Jesus, you would do with a thousand times more than what you got, you would do exactly what you're doing with what you have right now. He said, For he that has to him shall be given. He that has not from him shall be taken even that which he has. Is that fair? (laughs) And then he said, So is the kingdom of God as if a man should cast seed into the ground. All this has to do with seed. The Lord is giving us seed tonight in his word. He gave me a seed of anointing to start with. He gave us seed. He gave Phyllis and I that seed of ten dollars, hmm, yeah. to start with, didn't he? Yeah. What if we hadn't obeyed him in sowing that five dollars, and then doing what he told us to do with the other five? Well, depending on if we'd have got the lesson right the next month or the next year or never. We'd have either been delayed in getting what he had for us or it would have never happened. You and I wouldn't know each other. And we'd, you know, we'd be unhappy and feel like there's more and be unsatisfied but wouldn't know why. Probably wouldn't know that there was a Sarasota, Florida. I'm serious. Or a Branson. Hmm? Don't despise a a small seed, a seed tiny, like a grain of mustard seed, is the most precious thing because it has the power to reproduce and multiply and become greater. And you can sow that one little seed and then sow seed off the tree it makes. And then sow off the ten trees they make. Come on, are you listening? And the next thing you know. You'll be like some folks I saw recently in California. 8,000 acres. Hallelujah. Glory. Glory to God. And that's a spread. Amen. They started with just little small roots. and hmm, Seeds. Seeds. Somebody say seeds. seeds. Don't despise a small seed. Esteem it. The seed that you have, man, you ought to make a big deal out of it. Don't compare it to somebody else's. That's what God gave you. That's what you have instead of nothing. And it's the key to your future. It's the key to having huge resources. Depending on what you do with it. Said out loud, I value my seed. Luke 19. Luke 19. Luke 19 is the the story of what we call the parable of the talents. You remember how God, Jesus, uh, talked about the the man giving to this one this amount and this one that amount. One of them went and doubled his, the other guy doubled his, and one guy hid his. You remember that? Went and hid his. Because he was afraid. He didn't value his seed, and he didn't invest it, didn't sow it. And so the Lord was displeased with him. And back up to about verse 22 or so, Luke 19, 22. He said, out of your own mouth, I'll judge you, you wicked servant. You knew that I was an austere man, taking up what I laid uh, not down, reaping that I did not sow. Uh, You know, it's amazing, God includes us in the creative faith power process. He made us in his own likeness and image. He put a measure of his own faith in us. And then he put seed in our hands and in our life. 
And He doesn't just do it all for us. He expects us to take that and use our faith and believe for miracles. Come on, are you listening? He expects us to do it so that when things happen, it wasn't just everything done for us. We had a part of it. We were involved in the creative process. We're involved in the miracle. We had a part. Don't notice the term working of miracles. (laughs) Working. Why working? We got a part. We can't do his part. But he doesn't do our part. He goes on to say, verse 23, Wherefore then gavest thou not my money to the bank, that at my coming I might require mine own with usury? You could have at least invested it somewhere where it would have made some money. You could have done something. Is this God talking? You could have done something rather than just sit on it and do nothing. Because it was only one. And because you were scared. Keep reading. He said to them that stood by. Is everybody awake? Everybody listening? What do you do? Take it. Take from him the pound. And give it to him. That has ten pounds. And what did the people say? They exclaimed. (laughs) They said. Lord, he's already got 10. What are they saying? That's not right. (laughs) That's not fair. Guy only had one. You going to take away one, his only one, and give it to the guy that's 10? Yes, he is. (laughs) To him that has. To him that has and values what he has. And uses what he has. Come on, are you listening? Yes. To him is going to be given more. Why? Because he'll do something with it. But from him that has not. And doesn't value it. And doesn't try. Is he going to be given more? No, no he's going to lose what he's got. And that's fair. I said that's fair. To say anything else. Is to say the Lord's not fair. That is completely contradictory to humanistic, so-called socialism. Did you hear me? Because what is, the, what is man's godless man's solution? Take it from the man that's got ten. He don't need all that ten. Huh? Take it away from him. And give it to the poor man. This only got one or didn't have one. No, that's not right. I said, that's not right. That's not right. That's not right. There's a way that seems right to people. Huh? But the end is distortion and destruction. It's not right. (laughs) They said, Lord... He has 10 pounds. <laughs> they exclaimed. He's, try- he's teaching. And they, they couldn't help it. They couldn't be quiet. They cried out. The NIV says, sir, he's already got 10. <laughs> and the easy to read says it like this. The men said to the king, sir, that servant already has 10 bags of money. Go give him another one. The king said, people who use what they have will get more. Those who do not use what they have will have everything taken away from them. This is different from how men think. Hmm? Isn't it? But it's right. I said it's right. Who should get more? Those who are faithful. Those who do what the Lord told them to do with it. Those who wouldn't do what he told them, should they get more? Should it be taken away from people that have? Because they obeyed God? And given to those who don't have it to start with because they didn't obey God? Because if they they hadn't been obeying God, what's going to happen right now? 
That's going to be gone right away. And all you did was hurt the faithful man. Because no matter how much the faithful man or woman gets, the reason they're so blessed is because they're not in this just to get rich to start with. No matter how much they get, they will do what he tells them to do with it. Come on, are you listening? That's why they keep getting more and more and more. And if they'll keep obeying him, they're going to keep getting more. And instead of others that don't have as much getting mad, getting envious, getting upset, they need to humble themselves and admit, have I done what he told me to do? If you won't be faithful with the tithe, you don't even get started. And how many church going people are still fussing about the tithe? Whew. So it's no wonder. It's no wonder that surplus is so rare. Is it? And don't judge anybody. Don't judge anybody. No person, no preacher, no kin folks. Come on, are you listening, everybody? What can we do? The Lord knew who was going to be here tonight. You're here. I'm here. What can we do? Let's make up our mind. I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to quit dreaming about the by and by and pie in the sky. And when my ship comes in, I need to focus on where I am right now. Come on, are you listening? With what's in my hand right now. What's available to me right now. Because that is determining what I'm going to get tomorrow. Or how quickly it happens and the way it happens. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Lord told me about that anointing thing. He said, son, be faithful in what I've already given you. Do everything you know how. Use your faith. Trust me. Don't despise it. Do everything you know how. Why? Because it's why I don't have nothing. He gave me this. So I don't have, it's not that I have nothing. I have something. How many think we ought to rejoice that we got something? I got something. And this is my seed. And this, I got an opportunity to demonstrate that I will do what he tells me to do. I'll do it. I'll step out by faith. I'll obey him. And how many believe you can count on him that if you obey him with the five, obey him with the ten. Come on, are you listening? Obey him with the hundred. Obey him with the thousand. It's going to keep getting bigger. Next thing you know, you're handling tens of thousands. Next thing you know, it's scores of thousands. Come on, are you listening? Hundreds of thousands, millions. Millions. Billions? <laughs> but don't be looking off in the pie in the sky. You know, what did I say? By and by, pie in the sky. Where, where are we? We're, we're here. We're here. We're here. What kind of man's going to abound in blessings? What kind of woman's going to abound in blessings? Stand on your feet, everybody. Oh, somebody say, thank you, Lord. 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 Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Let's lift up our hands to the Lord. Let's tell him that we believe he's faithful. We believe, Lord, we believe you are righteous. We believe you are just. Everything you do is right. No matter what men think and men say, if they disagree with you, they're just wrong and blind and confused. Because you are right, right, always right. Always right. Everybody, here in the building, there in Branson, on the internet, everybody said out loud, Father God, I believe in you. And I confess, you are a just God. You are a fair God. Completely fair and good. Everything you do, everything you don't do, is perfectly just and righteous and fair. Thank you for giving me seed. Forgive me any times in the past 
that I didn't do all with what you gave me that I should have. Forgive me at any time I didn't obey you with any resource in any situation. That's not my heart. That's not my desire. Forgive me and by your grace help me teach me show me how to be completely faithful to you with what I have where I am right now hallelujah oh thank you Lord